Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Justin Champion Memorial Roundtable on the role of the public historian in 21st century Britain. Uh, now, this event has been organized by the Public History Seminar of the Institute of Historical Research. It's the first time in nine years that we fielded a commemorative event. And in those nine years, only once have we even devoted a meeting to the achievement of a single scholar. And it's definitely the first time that we've had an audience which has now reached 100 and is scheduled to reach quite a lot more than that. Now to us organizers who, are, who have in the past been accustomed to gatherings of about a dozen, this is quite a tonic. Thank you very much for coming. Now this event is more than a dutiful acknowledgement of scholarly achievement. Justin's work had not been completed. He was fizzing with ideas and initiatives until the end of his life. We can only speculate about what direction that might have taken. What we have instead this evening are reflections from our speakers on Justin's legacy in the light of the quite rapid changes which have taken place in the popular understanding of public history even since Justin died. Justin had a very special relationship to the emerging field of public history. He took every opportunity to speak to audiences beyond the round of seminars and conferences. He was a prolific broadcaster with a special attention to radio, which he maintained over a period of 10 years. He was prepared to speak out on topical concerns that went beyond his own immediate expertise. For example, his role in the commemoration of Magna Carta in, in 2015, his championing of black history, and what must have been his very last lecture, receiving the Medlicott Medal from the Historical Association and speaking on the theme of roads must fall. That award, the Medlicott Medal, was acknowledgement of his presidency of the Historical Association, which I'm sure he valued, perhaps most of all, for the scope it continued to give him to speak out and to reach out. Justin raised the profile of public history amongst historians by insisting on its centrality to the discipline, notably in his inaugural of 2008 with that refreshingly blunt title, What Are Historians For? He took the lead in starting Royal Holloway's MA in Public History, and I can vouch for the originality and excitement of that program since I was the first external examiner on the degree. Public historians sometimes keep their public engagements very separate from their real, in inverted commas, their real work as scholars. But Justin's commitment to public history was all the stronger because it drew so productively on his own original research. So the Christian thinkers of the late 17th and early 18th centuries may not be household names, even among his colleagues, but the issues that they were fighting over were also the issues for today. The clash between civic values on the one hand and the presumption of faiths in demanding that the world be organized in accordance with their revelation on the other. And beyond that, the culture of toleration which emerged from those struggles. Justin did not hesitate to draw out the parallels with today. And this indeed was the subject of one of his many radio programs. Justin Champion was particularly drawn to the analogy between history and activism, which raises the question, of course, how do we define action and activism in this context? It could mean placing one's professional skill in the service of an ideology as part of a movement and, and would become a kind of campaigning process. That isn't what Justin meant, though reading between the lines of his recollections, perhaps he was on the brink of becoming so, at the time of the invasion of Iraq in 2003. But when Justin asked, what are historians for? The gist of his answer was an unfashionable one, civic engagement. Justin didn't maintain that all history should resonate with the concerns of the present, but when it did so, the historian in his view had an obligation to make it available to citizens to the benefit of their intellectual grasp and their capacity for action. So in a sense, this was activism by proxy. For Justin, public history brought together historical material with the capacity to speak to current concerns 
uh, and the medium through which the shift in audience can actually be achieved. He was, to use a, a favorite phrase of Justin's, keeping their views in the conversation, keeping the views of historic actors in the conversation. The tone in which Justin laid out the connection between history and citizenship made it sound fresh and innovative, a reflection perhaps of his own enthusiasm and his commitment. But the relation between history and citizenship was not of course new. It had been an intermittent theme amongst historians since the Victorians pondering over their responsibility towards a recently enlarged electorate. Since then, however, citizenship has had little more than a nominal presence in the historian's lexicon. Justin gave the idea of fresh life, and above all, he demonstrated what it can mean in practice that it's not just rhetoric. I'm confident that in the course of this evening's discussions, we will hear further applications of what surely is or should be a central strand of public history today. Thank you. Over to you, Edward. Well, thanks very much indeed, John. It was, it was just great to listen to you there. My name is Edward Madigan. I'm one of the organizers of this evening's event. And I'm just thrilled to see so many people gather together for an event in memory of Justin Champion. Um, Justin never had to deal with all of the challenges and frustrations of the online world of Zoom and, and Teams and teaching into the void and speaking to people in this manner. And, and I know he would have been very frustrated by it. Um, I can just imagine the oaths he would have sworn. But what he would have loved is, is the inclusivity of the medium. He would have loved the reach of Zoom and the fact that we can have people from not just all over the country, but all over the world with us this evening. So thank you very much indeed for, for turning out to remember our friend and to tune into what promises to be an excellent discussion about the role of the public historian in the 21st century. So I'm gonna very briefly introduce each of our speakers, beginning with our chair for the evening, Dr. Alex Green, who is also of course, one of the event organizers. Alex is a senior lecturer in history at the University of Essex and founder of the Public History Seminar at the Institute of Historical Research. Justin was, of course, a great supporter of the IHR seminar and, and knew Alex well, indeed worked with her on at least one writing project. Uh, Alex has written numerous articles on public history and the relationship between history and policy, and is the author of the groundbreaking 2016 book, History, Policy and Public Purpose, Historians and Historical Thinking in Government. And I remember at the launch for that book, in Senate House, which happened on the day that the Brexit, the result of the Brexit referendum was announced in 2016, uh, Justin gave one of his bravura uh, appeals to public conscience, and uh, well, I was certainly quite moved. He also played Fight the Power by Public Enemy, so that was one of that was in very Justin uh, Justinian style. And <laughs> um, now to our pal panelists, um, in strict alphabetical order, I'm going to begin with. Dr. Shamima Akhtar, who is a lecturer in history at Royal Holloway, University of London. Uh, Shamima is a former past and present fellow in race, ethnicity and equality in history. And her research has focused on representations of the Irish and the broad themes of race, empire and identity in the British empire. Uh, she's worked on numerous museum projects and is currently working on a monograph entitled Exhibiting Irishness. Empire, Identity and Race, 1851 to 1970. Um, I had the pleasure of working closely with Shamima last year on the MA in Public History at Royal Holloway, which was of course founded by Justin way back in 2009. Uh, our next speaker, Daisha Brabham, is a graduate of that very degree, um, which he attended as a Fulbright Scholar from 2019 to 2020. Now, the final project that Daisha submitted I think was one of the most ambitious and imaginative pieces of public history our faculty have had the pleasure of reviewing over the years. It was an extraordinary piece of work. Uh, Daisha collaborated with the Black Cultural Archives in Brixton to organize a series of transatlantic uh, talks, workshops and seminars on aspects of Black, British and African-American history. Uh, she's currently working as a high school teacher in New Haven in Connecticut 
and as a member of the adjunct faculty at Southern Connecticut State University. Um, Daisha is joining us, of course, from New Haven, and we're really grateful, Daisha, that you've taken time out of a working day to tune in. It is, of course, the middle of the afternoon on the east coast of the US. Now, our next speaker, Dr. Stephen Franklin, is another graduate of the MA in Public History at Royal Holloway, who also had the honor of being Justin's final PhD student. Um, now, Stephen's doctoral research explored 20th century interpretations and commemorations of Magna Carta. And at his Viva, um, which I had the honor of attending as, as the final, I suppose, the, the supervisor who took over from Justin after he could no longer uh, be involved with the project. But I distinctly remember Stephen speaking very eloquently about how much Justin had inspired and encouraged him. Um, Stephen's been involved in a whole range of really dynamic public facing history projects over the past number of years. For most of last year, he was the social media director for Egan Museum, and he has now joined the National Archives as their digital engagement officer. It's really great to see you here tonight, Stephen. Um, next is uh, Professor Ludmilla Jordanova, um, with whom many of you will be familiar. Uh, Ludmilla is Professor of Visual Culture, Professor Emeritus, I should say, of Visual Culture in the Department of History at Durham University. And over the course of an extraordinary career, she has greatly enriched our understandings of the ways in which the public understand and relate to the past and the various roles that history plays in modern societies. Uh, she's published a whole range of books and articles on these themes, including the excellent History in Practice, which, along with John Tosh's why History Matters, I think it's become a, a core text for um, public history programs all over uh, Britain, the US uh, and, and Europe and indeed elsewhere in the world. It's certainly been a core text for our students at Royal Holloway. Next, uh, it's a real pleasure to introduce someone who was a personal friend of Justin's and who worked with him for many years at Royal Holloway. Graeme Smith, uh, is Professor of Oral History at the University of Newcastle and has made an invaluable contribution to the field of oral history, both as a prolific author and as a very active chair of the Oral History Society for more than a decade. Uh, Graham also co-edits the Historians for History website, which provides a platform for discussion on all aspects of public history. Um, he's published widely on a range of different themes including most recently on the experience and perception of food banks in Britain, which is of course, unfortunately, uh, these days a very topical subject. Um, I worked with Graham and Justin uh, in the years after I joined the faculty at Royal Holloway and I have extremely fond memories of putting the world to rights with the two of them um, in, the, in the hallway and in Justin's office at Royal Holloway. So just seeing you here this evening, Graham, reminds me immediately of, of, of Justin. Now last, but by no means least, I'm really delighted to introduce Professor Anna Whitelock, another friend and former colleague of Justin's. Anna is Professor of the History of Monarchy at City University of London and Director of the Centre for Modern Monarchy. Until very recently, though, she was member or a member of the history faculty and indeed head of department at Royal Holloway, where she worked closely with Justin in launching the MA in Public History um, and initially directing that degree programme. Now, Anna has published widely on the history of the British monarchy and is currently heading a major AHRC project on the history of the relationship between Queen Elizabeth II and the Caribbean. Anna has, of course, as many of you will know, been a tireless advocate for public history throughout her career. And I'm sure a lot of you would have seen her on the television or heard her voice on the radio. And um, just looking at you now, Anna, I'm reminded that Quite a while before Justin passed away, you, you, you mentioned to me that he was one of the things that made working at Royal Holloway a good thing and made it such a good place to be, the, the history department there. And I don't think there's a member of faculty who would disagree with that point of view. So it's, it's really wonderful to see you here this evening. All right, those are our speakers. Um, without any further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Alex to launch into the discussion. Thank you so much, Edward, and thank you also for your generous introduction. Um, I will uh, I will move very swiftly on to um, our speakers. Our first speaker is going to be Shamima Akhtar, but perhaps if I may, for a few seconds before I do so, just say a few words about what Justin meant to me, which was um, he was someone who 
really helped me find my voice as a historian. I um, had another career before I moved into academia. And while I was still a PhD student, indeed, we co-wrote a short piece on uh, public history um, in, in Britain. And his generosity, his, um, his keen interest and um, his investment, I would say, in that writing project really helped me feel that actually I was a historian, had something that I could share and something to contribute to the field. So I will always be grateful to him for, for that uh, contribution to my own professional development. But enough of me, I think we need to move swiftly on to our panel. And can I please ask Shamima Akhtar uh, to kick us off? Okay, so um, I'll, I'll keep it brief, but just as an overview, I, I didn't um, ever meet uh, Justin, but I can tell how kind of influential he was um, in the department and particularly teaching the MA in public history. So this is just kind of a series of reflections um, from reading some of uh, Justin's work. So in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder in May 2020, uh, discussions on institutionalized violence, endemic racism and white supremacy have taken place in the streets, in governments and higher education. The public has had to confront how our understandings of the past shape current discrimination, inequalities and oppression. In the UK in particular, Black Lives Matter protesters have signaled to the long-standing historic roots of uh, racism in Britain and demands that they first be acknowledged um, and secondly eradicated. For instance, Britain's colonial legacy was brought to the fore with a statue of Edward Colston, a slave trader being removed from a plinth and dumped in Bristol, Bristol's harbour, where it now rests in Bristol's museum. In part, this has prompted the UK's civic and learning institutions to reflect on where names of benefactors of the slave trade, eugenicists or architects of empire still remain on their own buildings, plinths or street signs. A potentially transformative debate on Britain's cultural values is raging, whereby we are questioning how to negotiate with the legacies of colonialism, which have shaped contemporary Britain, whether in terms of its wealth, its institutions or its national treasures. However, a conservative and far right backlash to these conversations has grown. The conservative think tank policy um, called Policy Exchange has a monitoring project uh, titled History Matters, which argues that according to their website, history is the most active front in a new cultural. And it tracks institutions who have taken steps to remove statues, rename buildings or update university curricula. What this project fails to recognize is that British history has always been politicized in public spaces, public memory and in school education. It's a fiction to believe that history can be held as a solid or immovable entity. Good history is constantly challenged and reinterpreted. And the perspectives by which we understand historical facts, analyze sources and construct an argument emerge from society, lived experience and shared values. The ways in which we choose to narrativize the past to the public correlate with the stories we are telling about Britain as a society, a community and a nation. The current government is engaged in a concerted attack on the heritage and museum sector in Britain. Uh, former now Gavin Williamson, Se a Secretary of State for Education, has uh, was warned heritage bodies over the summer against taking significant steps in re-evaluating British history as part of an intensification of a culture war that largely exists in the press columns of the Times. The fact that the inclusion of diverse histories and alternative perspectives is to do with standard methodological practices is being purposefully misunderstood by the architects of this new legislation. Crucially, Britain's understanding of its past is contradictory and false at times. For example, a YouGov poll conducted in 2019 found that 32% of the public thought the British Empire was, uh, quote, something to be proud of, with a further 37% expressing neutrality on the issue. So consequently, without proper understanding, um, without properly understanding the British Empire and subsequent migration, it becomes possible to excise people of colour and minoritised communities from Britain's history, and public history in particular. Categories of Britishness, of British and then hyphenated, of foreign born or natural domicile are ways by which separation is created in national classifications. Public history in Britain should not shy away from this truth. Britain's migration story should become a central part of the country's public history. Public history should reject reductive understandings of uh, Britain as an island nation or one that inevitably progressed to urban modernity. 
public history should invite viewers to be uncomfortable and wrestle with the truths of how racism, slavery, and imperial violence shaped and continue to shape modern Britain. It could tell the story by focusing on globality, on networks and diasporas that emphasize change and not fixity, that embrace the transnational and varied perspective, perspectives along race, gendered and class lines. By focusing on the movements of people, groups and communities and their beliefs, ideas and material culture, Britain can reimagine its national story. New interpretations, innovative methodologies and difficult stories enable a better understanding of how the British past has shaped the British present. A public history that fails to contextualize Britain's layered and complex history of migration or the moving boundaries between nation and empire in the past ultimately fails to account for how Britain came to be the multi-ethnic, multilingual and multi multinational country it is today. Thank you for my remarks. Thank you, Shamim. That got us off to a fantastic start and has foregrounded, I think, some issues that other, other speakers will come to pick up on. So, Ludmilla, can I ask you to, to pick up the baton, as it were? Yes, thank you, Alex. Um, I knew Justin for many decades, and I think that we first met uh, on a radio programme, so that very much reinforces uh, the point about him as a public historian long before this was a recognised role in the UK. And I'd like to thank the organisers for inviting me to participate in this event, which I think is hopeful and sad at the same time. It's hopeful because it's clear that now more than ever, we need to be speaking about public history with the passion and urgency, just as Justin did. But it's sad, of course, because Justin is not here to urge us on and to bring his own inimitable energy to our discussions. Now, I first became interested in public history in the second half of the 1990s, when I was preparing the first edition of History and Practice. And I spoke to lots of historians uh, as part of that work. And I was surprised to find that many professional historians in the UK were actually unfamiliar with the term and viewed what is often presented as, quote, public engagement with a mixture of skepticism and detachment. So a great deal has changed since then. As a field, public history is now a recognized part of the academic landscape. Obviously, Justin played a large part in that. And we only need to think about the proliferation of master's programs to appreciate that this is a significant shift. But public history practices are also prolifer proliferating, for example, in digital media. And we might also think about the rise of historical publications in a form that's familiar from graphic novels. And since I work on visual culture, this is a form of history that I'm particularly interested in. So just about everyone knows about Art Spiegelman's Mouse, for example. And a particular favorite of mine in this genre is Abina and the Important Men. But I, of course, we're registering today that our whole world has changed in some fundamental ways too. And I see public history as being necessarily cognizant of and responses to, responsive to major alterations in human societies and their environments, no matter what, what the nature of those alterations may be. So I think even from those few words, the role of the public historian follows. I mean, I might mention here just four of its as aspects. It's part of our role to acquaint ourselves both sympathetically and critically with new media and changing cultural forms. It's part of our role to recognize, compare and evaluate the many forms of public history that are current so that we accept the existence of public histories in the plural. And it's integral to that is collaborating seriously with the full range of makers as well as consumers who may of course sometimes be one and the same while being skeptical about hierarchical thinking which presents some forms of public history as somehow quote better than others and for me my main outlet for that has been very much work uh, with museums but I also think it's part of our role to apply the same approach 
to history in general. And part of that is to eschew binaries such as academic, non-academic, or professional and popular in favor of constantly considering the many forms that historical concern takes. And the example I like to use in this context is genealogy and family history, because I think it's really important that professional historians recognize, respect, and engage with people who undertake those forms of history. And the fourth aspect of our role, I think, is to maintain a commitment to sharing, to sharing the types of evidence that are available, to sharing ways of evaluating it, and also to sharing what I'm calling as a kind of shorthand here, the burden of interpretation. And always showing our workings would be another way of expressing the same point. Now in practice, many historians, however we define that term, already do all of this. When I told one of my Durham colleagues that I was interested in public history, he responded, I didn't know there was any other kind. Now I've often pondered on his reply, which strikes me now as both right and wrong. It is right in that when we communicate our ideas and findings, they enter the public domain. There is no confidentiality clause in operation in university seminars, for example. And what we teach, say, and write moves around in the world. When historical ideas leave our mouths and fingers, they become public, so that all historical activity may be public history. But my colleague was wrong in that many historians don't see it that way at all. And the rise of a field called public history can be an encouragement to see it as a specialism. That is, as not as something that inheres in all historical activity, which is what I see it as. Furthermore, we can assert that all historians have broad social responsibility for the ways in which the past is understood and more specifically for what they themselves say about that past. Historians then have agency, although that's an idea that needs a lot of teasing out. We were asked to comment on Justin's appeal for more, a more consciously activist approach to public history. What is meant by activism? For me, it's any concerted action that is directed at change so that activism and agency are inseparable. But how do we take action specifically as historians? Well, by challenging untruths, distortions, and manipulations of the past, as we have come to understand it, by demonstrating publicly how essential it is to make sound arguments using evidence about the past and the many versions of it that abound. We do it by seeking out collaborators and the widest possible audiences. Some such activities will be stimulating and exciting, others markedly less so, challenging politicians and newspapers, for instance. And here I'd like to say that I think some very old fashioned forms of activism are rather important, like writing to MPs. And I do actually think on some evidence that this can be effective. So if every time a historical untruth is mouthed, I realize this is a big project, to have some pushback, I think would be actually a very powerful form of activism. The key point here, I think, is for all historians to think of themselves as active citizens, to welcome collaborators wherever they may be found, and to keep finding fresh ways of attending to and discharging their public purpose, to use Alex Green's, Alex Green's phrase, amidst the myriad of forms of change that are going on at the moment. Historians then, including public historians, are as invested in the present and the future as they are in the past. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ludmilla. Can I ask Daisha to, to follow on from that? Thank you so much. 
Um, hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here today. I'm really um, honored to take part of this discussion. Um, similar to Shamima, I did not actually meet Justin, but I feel as if, um, especially with reading his works and being a graduate of the program from which he founded, that his work and his, um, his work his thoughts are my, very relevant to my own pathway as a public historian and also really relevant in terms of what I think is happening here in the States. So I think I'll also speak a little bit about how his work has um, kind of translated to the field of his, public history specifically in the United States as well. Um, I guess just kind of speaking a little bit about things, I kind of wanted to kind of reflect on my own background and how I was kind of thrust into the um, profession of public history. Um, I think I was largely thrusted in really in search of representation of my own past. Um, when I first began as a student, um, actually studying abroad at the University of Plymouth, um, I was my large focus, my focus was largely early modern history. Um, I was really focused on the tutors, specifically looking at aristocratic women. And it really wasn't until I and I think largely I was interested in those topics, not only because they're really engaging and awesome, um, but also because of the fact that those are the topics that are largely consumed by the public. Um, and it really wasn't until I started to think about my own past and historical lineage that I really began to yearn for stories in which I not only was represented, but also stories that could explain the everyday present phenomenon that I could see every day um, in my life, such as redlining, segregation in schools, and so I think that when I first began to explore applying to the rural history public history program, I was really excited at the chance to really not only be a voice um, in this work of bringing representation to diverse audiences, but also to kind of reimagine what the what the purpose of history is. Um, through reading um, Justin's work, what is what are historians for? One of the lines that stuck out to me the most was when he mentioned that much of history has been presenter led, using the talking historian to provide a narrative background for the visual components of history. And when I kind of reflected on my own experiences of the topics that were largely talked about in my own undergraduate program, that's really what it was. Um, audience members were not necessarily asked to be active participants in the discussions of history, but rather passive learners. And so when I was thinking about my projects and the public history projects that I've worked to create, I really think that I was inspired um, to really, again, reimagine what is the role of a historian um, and how can we help the public not only to learn more and be truth tellers, but also to help um, the public become active participants in that, um, in that work. Um, I think in particular, this um, subject is really, really important, um, largely because of um, what we see here in the States um, with the vicious attacks on anti-racist education and specifically um, the role of historians in our society. Um, if I know, again, um, coming from the UK, you might not be familiar with the several proposals that have been put to legislators to um, modify history curriculums, to um, reshape um, the role of the history teacher in the classroom, what topics are allowed and what topics are not. And oftentimes what I have seen is that my colleagues who are historians don't necessarily, will kind of, kind of take a passive attention to it and don't necessarily feel as if they need to be a part of those conversations. And so I think the legacy of Justin's work is not only in terms of rethinking um, the role of the historian or what we believe is a traditional historian, but also rethinking the way in which we in, get engrossed in, our, in learn about history. Um, and I guess I just wanted to speak lastly and just speaking on being a graduate of the program someone who really, um, my university did not have a public history program um, when I was graduating, having a space to be able to not only work collaboratively with my professors, but also with my um, other students to kind of develop new frameworks from which we can work um, was really beneficial. So I just wanted to mention that. Sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dosha. I think there's so much building up over those three speakers already about um, historians stepping forward and into a, into public debate, rather than necessarily um, stepping back into our 
discipline and into the kind of practices and sort of methods with which we've been trained. And I suppose another one might be to think about what are those um, resources or tools that we need to equip people with to be able to be active citizens? What is, to use the Miller's phrase, what are, you know, we're gonna show our workings, what are those workings and how do we share those uh, with wider public? So, so much emerging already from the conversations. Uh, Graham, uh, can I ask you to join? Thank you, Alex, and thanks to Edward and John as well for organizing tonight's event. Um, if enough of us think about Justin, I, I reckon we could lose, another conservative politician could lose their job. So, I think we need to make this an annual event or maybe even a daily event. I think that would be in the spirit of Justin. Um, I, I, tonight's meeting is important for two reasons, I think. To celebrate a friend of history and, in Justin's view, a friend of public history, because one was the same thing as the, as the other. Like Trevelyan, Justin would assert that burying the past under heaps of learning was a pointless indulgence. And I guess that was the starting point of our friendship, which I'll, I'll say something a wee bit more about in a minute. But the second reason why tonight's important, and I think Daisha's put it well in terms of the situation, the states, but we're seeing the same situation in, internationally, actually. We're seeing a, a, a rise of reaction um, against the study of the past, uh, except for a, a particular ideological slant. And of course, it's, 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 it's buried and hidden uh, in a particular way that makes it look as if the most powerful amongst us are victims. Um, and that's, that's certainly not the case. So it's a timely juncture to discuss why we should engage with the publics of public history. Uh, a time when, uh, you know, we see in the UK relatively uh, recent from the victory of Brexit, the historians of Brexit recasting themselves as reclaiming history. I, I'm still trying to work out what they're claiming history from. It may well be the public, actually, and I'll come back to that point in a minute. But I said to say something about how I, I ended up working with, with, with Justin and being a friend of Justin's. And it really it, 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 it revolved around meeting in Sainsbury's on Saturday morning at eight o'clock, because neither of us wanted to be meet the other useless men that go shopping on a Saturday. So that was the reason why uh, I, I got to know him. And I didn't realize it was 2008, it was a year after he'd, he'd written What Are Historians For? And I hadn't realized what was happening in 2008 was I was being interviewed for a position in the history department. Um, and I didn't, I didn't quite realize that's what happened on Saturday mornings in Sainsbury's, but this went on for almost a year. And we had raging rows in Sainsbury's. And one of the reasons why our families didn't see the food that we were supposed to be returning uh, with for at least a few hours was because we were engaged in these arguments in the middle of Sainsbury's. I can't think of a more public history setting than the middle of <laughs> two um, trolleys jammed together and us arguing. One of the arguments that we had, and it's something that we might want to pick up on, was around what, what was national history and what was international history and what would be national, national public history and what would be international public history. What would those things actually look like and how would uh, issues around co uh, colonization and decolonization fit into that sort of discussion. So it was a very early discussion. But one of the reasons that, that it came about was, I don't know if you notice in what our historians, hist historians for, but if you read that paper quite closely, there's a muddle, I would say, Justin would argue otherwise, between England and Britain. And I think that's an interesting problem that uh, British historians have. And I'm not sure how we can begin to decolonize unless we begin to accept the fact that actually there are more than one Britain and there's more than one public of, of public history. And we, we need to be unpicking some of that. The other, the other stuff that we'd argue about would be the role of community history. And I think this is an interesting area for us to think about in relation to responding to uh, not only um, this, this move to the right in history, but also uh, 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 what's been some people have called counter publics and the idea of the fracturing of the public space and the public voice. Um, and, and, you know, like when I go back to very um, sometimes quite old fashioned ideas of organizations like the WEA, the National Trust, uh, 
and you know a whole host of i mean ihr actually and ihr seminars there might only be 12 people come along to an ihr seminar but the ihr and IR seminars do reach out and maybe only four or five people in a local wa branch come along but it's four or five in each uh, locality so there's a huge appetite for history uh, in in the uk in particular but there's also dozens of different organizations now the question that I've been raising for a, quite a long, a number of years now is, if all that is true, how come we've had this move to the right in history? How come we've had this culture war placed upon us? And I think one of the answers to that, and again, I'd like to hear Lynn Millis maybe say a wee bit more about this, is in relation to the state. Um, and I say Lynn Miller because Lynn Miller raised this er quite early on in, the, in discussions, was the role of the state in history. And I think we're still not attending to, attending to that particularly well. And what, what I did was basically think about the last decade and the number of commemorations, state-funded commemorations that we had, rolling up to, well, rolling through the independence referendum in Scotland and up into, into Brexit. So in that decade, you know, we began with Gove and his first culture war around our island story. And then we moved through the, through, uh, the Olympics in 2012, um, then the Scottish independence the, the debate, which coincided with the World War I four-year plan and, uh, the BB and massive amounts of material in the BBC about the First World War. We then rolled into Magna Carta, which Justin and I both have written on, um, and an expression of Eng English liber liberty that was contested, but nevertheless part of that same state-sponsored view of the past, if you like. And then into the 2014-2018 uh, commemoration of the First World War itself, where state-funded commemorations. I mean, the amount of money that's been spent on this, and I'll just give you an example from the First World War, um, £15 million on youth engagement, £10 million in cultural programmes, um, 5.3 million battlefield tours. And this was substantial investment for the state, and you can run that back through all of those ones that I've already mentioned. So when we get to the Brexit campaign in 2016, we've had, you know, a good solid five years, five or six years of quite intense uh, investment by the state into the shaping of history. And I, and I would argue that was signalled by Gove back in uh, 2011. Um, I'll clo clo close my remarks by saying I think we need to take it's very, very easy for historians, I think, to say, well, actually, you know, this this is conf this culture war is confected. And it's absolutely right to say that, but that doesn't mean to say it isn't serious. And the reason I think it's serious is because of that fracturing of the public space. That, and I think, you know, we're, I, I don't know if what other people's experience of COVID has been, but I think it's exacerbated that, that we're much more likely to be living in little bubbles where, we hear very little of, 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 of other opinions. And one of the things that Justin always took seriously was other people's opinions. He would spend hours replying to the most mad letters that he'd ever, ever seen. And eventually knock on my door and say, how do I answer this guy who doesn't believe that there was an enlightenment? And I said, well, you just explain that it's Scottish, not English. And I'll, <laughs> I'll finish my remarks there. Thank you so much, Graham. I think there's a lot there to unpick that we might pick up later in terms of um, national public history being international public history inherently. And I think that's something that perhaps has happened within the field itself, which is that British history is inescapably international history, but has not really permeated um, into um, into our involvement with in terms of public engagement. So, and the role of commemoration as well. Thank you for flagging that. I think that's something we can also pick up on in the discussion. Uh, Stephen, would you like to take us to the next stage, please? Thank you very much, Alex, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, well, to be honest, uh, given the, uh, the theoretical, uh, you know, gymnastics we've been put through by the, the following, uh, by the previous uh, um, participants, I fear that what I'm about to say will probably fall short. But, um, you know, Justin was always the type of historian that would never... Um, in a million years say that you shouldn't say what you think so uh, here goes I suppose um, 
this this piece has a quite personal thing for me because it actually I I, I came across it much to my own embarrassment um, a couple of weeks before my uh, Viva. Um, yes, it it didn't make it into the uh, to the the the, the, the pre Viva version of my thesis, um, and I was thinking about why you know Justin may not have alerted me to it. Um, and I think it was the fact that actually the key thing about Justin was it was all about encouraging people to think for themselves um, and, you know, elicit and, you know, perform the skills of the historian. Um, Justin had his own views, um, but he was very willing and very capable and able um, of nurturing me in a process to find my own voice, much like you, Alex. Um, so I suppose this whole panel is very just in, in the sense that Justin was always very good at asking very simple questions that um, on the surface seem simple, but actually require aren't simplistic to answer. So there are multiple, numerous ways you could answer this question. You know, are historians to provide new knowledge? Are they, you know, to demonstrate research skills, uh, their powers of erudition, um, engage in debate, um, be critical and reflective, um, their powers of communication, whether that's through debate in the academy or within the public sphere, is a key duty of the historian to empower others, um, or is it, and also uh, to represent under uh, marginalized groups? Um, and in answer, all of those responses are valid. Um, but as, as ever with Justin, the answer is always more nuanced and always going to cause you more of a headache uh, than you first appear or, or think. Um, so actually, I suppose I think that historians don't necessarily provide all of the answers. Um, yes, we can provide views um, to questions and based on our research using the skills I just mentioned. Um, but much like Justin, I, I do believe that historians, whether in the academy or public sphere, are you know, fundamental to enabling people to think critically, providing a framework to which they can draw their own conclusions, much like Justin did with the multitude of PhD students, undergraduates, uh, master students, and so forth. The reality is, as many of the people that have spoken already have alluded to, the past is and can be a very ugly place. Um, it is mutable, it is debatable, um, people have different opinions. Um, and the historian's duty um, or a role of the historian is potentially help people navigate um, and to call out, if that is the right term, uh, opinions that potentially go against the grain of what the, uh, not, uh, of what the documentary evidence suggests. There's another really key thing that, um, that will always kind of stick with me uh, about Justin, and it was his incredible power to make people listen, to, uh, to inspire, you, you say. Um, and much of that came from his, the innate ability he had to think imaginatively with history. Um, thinking imaginatively uh, helps historians invoke empathy with their audiences helps inspire some form of cultural resonance. But there are also, I think, um, two ways that historians can think um, imaginatively. One way could easily be by innovative uses of technology. Um, and you know, this on in a professional sense for me in, my, in, in the work of social media is something that I'm constantly thinking about. What are the new and imaginative ways that I can implot and narrate history to thousands of people on a daily basis, um, what's the best way? And there are times when I do think to myself, is this the best use of my PhD? Um, but then I know that if I said that to Justin, he would laugh and say, well, yes, of course it is. You are informing the public and it doesn't matter how you're doing it, you're, you're doing an important job. As he says in his, um, in the article, a book not read is not dead, is not, it, not, 
mute but dead. Um, so yeah, actually engaging people where they are is an important and fundamental part and role of the historian. But then I also think there's another way in which you can think imaginatively, and Liv Miller alluded to this earlier, in the sense that we can think uh, imaginatively in the projects that we uh, think of, in the collaborations that we draw and make, and in the people that we talk to. That in itself can be imaginative. Uh, so yeah, I suppose that's basically where I'm going to leave it. I think as a final point, um, it says a lot that 13 years after his What Are Historians For, um, we're here still debating what the answer is. But in some sense, it's kind of the most fitting legacy for Justin. Thank you so much, Stephen. That's a fantastic, it takes on, and, and good to flag the, um, the role of imagination. Uh, which somehow for so many colleagues seems to be beyond the realms of what we do and yet imagination is absolutely implicit in every step in the processes that we use to make meaning so I think that's something we might want to return to. Um, Anna please wrap us up before we move into discussion. Thank you very much. Um, I first of all to say I feel quite emotional just being here and and um, it's obviously one of the first occasions where we've been able to kind of gather um, since Justin's um, death, um, given COVID. Um, and so it's it feels very special and it's great that um, Sylvia, Justin's wife is with us. Um, so I'm very pleased about that. Um, I'm just gonna offer a few reflections. I mean, Justin was, um, became a great friend. He was also uh, a great mentor and will remain, remain so. He um, was my first head of department and he took a bit of a punt on me um, in that when I applied for a job at Royal Holloway with a, a trade book, my first book was a book published by Bloomsbury. It was about to be rather than with an academic press. It was that kind of moment where he could see that actually that had the rigor of um, a book published by an academic press. Um, and it was, a, he's valued the fact that it was intended to reach a wider audience. And from the outset, really, he always championed, um, excuse the pun, uh, me and, and public history and the wider communication of history. Um, and so I just want to reflect on a few things that, you know, I've been thinking about, about public history. And all of that is very much also, of course, inspired by, by Justin. I mean, I think one of the things that was so remarkable about Justin was that, I mean, you know, he was the real deal as a historian, um, as an amazing historian of early modern political thought, who was editing texts. And, you know, he was that old fashioned scholar historian in many ways. But at the same time, he also had this remarkable ability to think big, um, to communicate big ideas. I mean, he was sort of both the, the hedgehog and the fox, if, if we think of it in, in terms of that, um, of, that, of that infamous essay. And so I think that raises the question then, you know, should all publicly funded historians be public historians and are they? Are we saying, or what is the relationship and the value of that sort of traditional history um, compared to public history? Um, and how does that mixed ecology work, assuming that we acknowledge perhaps that there should be a mixed ecology and that not all historians uh, are public historians or want to be public historians? I mean, I guess that's a question. What, what function, what responsibility do historians that are publicly funded have? Um, I also think there's a real challenge about the visibility of historians in public life. And I've been thinking about this a lot. I mean, and this picks up some of the comments that have been made, you know, we did have that discussion, we had that meeting after the day after the Brexit vote or the day of the Brexit vote. But before that, there'd been a meeting during the Brexit referendum of historians at number 11 Downing Street. And I'm not sure if anybody in the room came, but it was um, it was at the invitation of what well, it was sort of George Osborne was curating it alongside Chris Skidmore, who was his PPE, later the university's minister. And it was a room filled with um, historians and panel, uh, which was um, Linda Colley, David Canadine, Keith Thomas and Chris Clark. And I remember sitting next to Amber Rudd, who was basically like 
taking notes because she just kind of wanted information and the content. And the discussion was brilliant and rich, but the room was essentially full of Remainers. Um, it was people who were kind of sympathetic to the views that were coming out uh, from the panel. But the views were so significant and interesting and important and in, in many ways prophetic. And one of, the, one of the views that was expressed, particularly that struck me, was Keith Thomas. And he talked about Ireland and he talked about the issue of Ireland and how fundamental that was to this whole question of the Brexit discussion. And he just said, you know, the threat to the um, Good Friday Agreement, the bigger implications of this, we have to get this out. This is not in the media. And, and clearly, you know, it wasn't. It just didn't feed into the discussion. And when we had that, when we got together with Paul A at History Today, uh, with History Today at Senate House, the day of the Brexit referendum, I know that there was just in, I mean, we were all pretty depressed, um, but there was also a sense of a lost opportunity that we should and could have done more perhaps as public historians to be in that debate, be in that discussion. And I think, you know, increasingly now, what, do, how do we make ourselves more visible? I think there needs to be a kind of, you know, national history advisor. We need to be right in the room uh, in, in government, discuss policy discussion. We need to be there in the way that there is a national security advisor, a national economic advisor, we need to do more, we need to be in the room. It's no good just being on the outside. So, I mean, that's one challenge that I feel really urgent, is an urgent question and an urgent challenge. Um, I also think um, the question, and I know Justin was always thinking about this, how should public history be presented? What is its best medium? And we've, we've talked a bit about that in terms of, obviously Justin saw, I know, radio as the key thing. He thought that was much more nuanced, it was much more long form than television. We've also now got social media, uh, but what is the best way for, um, for public historians to communicate? Do we need to think a bit more outside the box to reach a wider and a different um, audience? And I suppose the, the sort of final thing, because I'm aware we've, we should really open it up for discussion is what we can learn from Justin himself. Yes, of course, as a public historian, but also as a man and it, already been mentioned how yes he had the great ability to speak with such authority and draw people in but has also been mentioned he was a great listener and he also had great empathy and I wonder therefore what as public historians do we need to take from that what is the function and the role of a public historian in terms of who should they be listening to and listening for with whom should they be feeling empathy and to what ends and I just feel like we should reflect a little bit on Justin, the man and the historian, because actually I think in that it will uh, point to um, a way in which public history perhaps needs to be um, taken forward. Um, thanks for the opportunity of this panel. Thank you, Edward and Alex, for pulling this together. It's a really, really important occasion. And um, yeah, let's have a wider discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much, Anna. You've wrapped us up in style. <laughs> So, um, we have about 15 minutes uh, for some discussions among the panel members before we open up to questions from the audience. So please do keep those coming in the chat um, as we speak. But I wonder if I might invite the panelists to reflect a bit on this question of the state, because it's, it's actually implicit in, I think, in every single contribution we've heard today. And I guess in Dosha's case, this is as much about federal um, government, um, as it is about state governments, there are tensions there between um, how individual states understand their histories within federal frameworks. So if I invite you to think about the state in the, in the broader terms, but perhaps each of you could say something about um, these questions about the role of the state as a funder, potentially. So someone in the, in the uh, chat was mentioning about museums, which obviously Lud Miller has um, immense experience of. So the state is a funder, it's also um, a legislator and a regulator. So the state has myriad roles potentially in terms of shaping the history that is commissioned and built and uh, put on display. Um, and I wonder if each of the panelists might want to say something about um, how they see the role of the state and how historians might engage and respond and challenge and be in conversation uh, with state actors. Um, I don't know who might want to kick that off, but I will leave it to any of the panellists to unmute themselves and, and, and offer an opinion if they so wish. I mean, I'm happy to start off if, you, if you're willing, Alex. 
so I'm a bit bothered by uh, by talking about the state as if it's self-evident what we mean. And I think we really need to disaggregate it. Uh, so Shamima referred to the problems that museums are undergo, or rather the DCMS controlled museums are undergoing at the moment. And I think it's really important that that's not seen as the state. There are a number of different actors involved with this and we need to disaggregate who's doing what. And um, one of the points that I think is most uh, important to take on board is that the people on the front line of this are actually the civil servants. So the civil servants are actually implementing government policy. And I'd like to see part of public history being communicating an understanding of how the civil service works. Does every child in school know about Nolan principles, for example? The history of Nolan principles is really interesting. Does the notion of an arm's length body mean anything to lots of people? These are not difficult things to explain. And you know, the, if we think that this may be about empowering, then I think it's absolutely our obligation to make sure that we are out there explaining, having conversations, making sure that people have the tools so they can evaluate the role of government. Because it is, it is I, 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 I'm tempted to say it's complex. I think that's not quite right. It's multifaceted. So it's a bit intricate, but it's not impenetrable. Can I just jump in there, Alec? Um, I mean, I totally agree with what um, Ludmilla said. And I just, I mean, she talked about we need to be out there. And I suppose my question is, do we also need to be in there? And in what way can we be in there? You know, we need to be in the room, um, you know. And of course, the irony is that, you know, so many of our politicians seem to have done PPE and even history and so on. But the, the lack of kind of historical, you know, informed historical engagement um, with, you know, just it, history is, of course, context. And just so often in policy briefings and in statements and in discussions, there is a lack of context. So I guess, is there not a really urgent need for public historians to be educating those people who, you know, today are now stepping into those new Secretary of State positions who have got, you know, what's the, you know, the, the most, the shorter and medium and longer term history of their brief and how do we how do we get in the room rather than shouting from the outside and being told you know what history is and what the humanities are for i think that's the kind of challenge how do we get inside thanks i wonder if i could bring daisha in here because someone put in the chat about history teachers and i wonder if you had any sense of how um uh, history teachers relationships with the state how well you know if we think about sort of compulsory education if you had anything to add on that front no, I definitely, definitely think it's a really interesting question, especially thinking about, again, the, the broad idea of the state, especially here in the United States, of thinking about how that plays out federally, um, statewide, or even locally. Um, we see, for example, even within my state of Connecticut, we see um, several different towns that have put forth legislation really um, basically putting teachers up to the fire, uh, essentially. Um, we've seen massive amount of protests at different board meetings. Um, teachers have been um, shouted at um, in, in, in response to this. And so I think it's a really important question. Um, I did see that question in the um, chat. And I do think that teachers do play an important role in, in public history, although I don't necessarily think that they're necessarily regarded as that um, oftentimes. Um, and so I think if we talk about how um, pub, how how teachers can support public history, it's really in having conversations um, and really being a part of the process of providing curricular resources for students to rethink that process, um, rethink not only for students, but also for teachers. I'm I kind of thinking about um, my first interaction when I was student teaching during my first year that the teacher who was in the classroom um, was telling the students that Christopher Columbus had came to um, Virginia despite the fact that he never did. And the reason why I bring that up is because so much of history teaching, um, traditional history teaching has largely been reproduced 
um, people reimagining. There hasn't been a lot of training on how do you deal with questions of identity? How do you deal with questions on identity of contested truth, national origin stories? And so because there hasn't been so much training, a lot of teachers have just been reproducing what they themselves have consumed. Um, and so I think the role of how public history teachers and also historians at large is really having conversations with each other and um, having conversations and dialogues. And then the action of that is providing resources for teachers who are in these situations. Um, I also think it's a, just a comment on the idea of the state, again, at large. I think it's a really, here in the States, it's a really interesting conversation because you do see so much so much of this is just contested about who owns history and who doesn't. Um, because in many cases in the States, I feel even the public is saying, you don't own this history as historians. No, we own it. Um, and so the history that we ing 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 are ingest is really something that should fit what we need, um, really. Um, and so you do see kind of like this loop-de-loop -loop going back and forth in terms of the legislation of people at board meetings saying, speak the truth about history. But then here in Connecticut, for example, um, we just passed legislation. I'm actually gonna be one of the teachers who are teaching it. We just passed legislation for all high school students to be required to take African-American and Latinx history. Um, so how that, but again, how has that been rolled out? Um, what has been the response to that? And so I definitely think that a lot of this is rooted in just people having conversations together and again, providing those resources um, and not taking kind of a standoff approach to it. Because I think a lot of times, especially when I speak to people who, can, who say they're historians, they often, oftentimes will say, oh, a lot of this work really needs to take place in undergraduate. Um, and then we wonder why people say, well, why it was college this like truth reckoning when all of my K through 12 or all of my younger education has largely been myths and mythology and, um, you know, one line statements. And so I definitely think that his, um, history teachers do play a really important role in that. Um, I wonder, Shamim, if you wanted to come in at that point, because you, you, you raised really early on this question about um, kind of the the absence I suppose of migration or trying to weave migration into a kind of island story and I don't know if the things that Dosha was saying connect at all with those thoughts about where we do the work that helps set people up to be active citizens. Yeah my immediate kind of response to to the question on on the state and its role in history was that arguably one of the kind of most influential positions and, and, and spaces that historians can occupy with the state in conversation with history is as part of the national curriculum. Um, in, in England, we have, you know, history is only compulsory till the age of 13, 14. With the Gulfian uh, reforms in kind of the, the late 2000s, there was this, uh, you know, purposeful um, reframing of, of Britain as an island uh, nation. And the, the national curriculum was, of course, um, was created in consultation with historians. So Peter Desena, who now works, um, or was working at Oxford, was one of those um, kind of architects of, of the, the curriculum. And the IHR's uh, current Teach Race Migration Empire campaign is about building a type of uh, institution similar to uh, the Holocaust um, Education Centre at UCL. The, for, for the Holocaust, it's made up of kind of survivors, um, activists, academics, and kind of uh, policymakers and doing a kind of similar thing with um, historians of race, migration and empire. So providing the, um, as has already mentioned, the kind of the resources to teach this type of history um, and also the kind of sensitivity training in, in, in equipping um, teachers with, with conveying these, these narratives. Again, another kind of important role that I think historians can play in, in, in navigating with, with kind of state narratives on history is this consistent undervaluing of humanities degrees and, and humanities in, in general, and this kind of bolstering of, of STEM. Uh, so the British Academy um, is currently launching their kind of program shape. So the social humanities, arts and, and uh, politics. And I think they're trying to kind of create a, a complementary narrative uh, for the humanities that exists for, for STEM. So the, the sense that, you know, it's not uh, a, a degree that, that leads to, um, to unemployment essentially. And I think that the using the state uh, as a way and, and a, kind of a, a form to uh, curate the national curriculum and then as um, a space by which we can kind of champion uh, history and the humanities more, more broadly is uh, kind of, a, a crucial one for public historians and, and one that historians have, have, have been part of the process anyway. So uh, it's 
it's kind of imperative to continue that. Thanks, Jamie. I can see Anna's hand up. Can I, do you want to come in now, Anna, and then I'll Stephen or, or Graham, if you have anything to add to our question about the state, then please do chime in after that. Sorry, just really quickly on um, education, and I have to, to leave early, so I'll just throw it in and I'll shut up. Um, but I was just going to say, I'm quite interested in at what point we can start teaching students public history. So, you know, is it a postgraduate activity or is it something in terms of a degree? Should we be thinking about an undergraduate public history degree, for example? Um, or at what point, you know, how much does do they need a kind of history curriculum and methodology and then public history added onto that? Or how much can it be curated as one and at what age? I just think that's also, um, you know, a discussion that perhaps might be had. If we want history graduates to be, you know, have this sort of activist mindset, can they get that from a history degree? Or does the history degree itself need to, in some ways, be tweaked and changed um, as well? Um, so that's just a thought. Um, thank you for letting me back in, Alex. Well, actually, those questions might be ones that Stephen and uh, Graham have answers to. I don't know if either of you want to come in at this point. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to go back to the state, though, and think a wee bit more about that. Um, I think historians have engaged, uh, I think Shereen is right, historians have, have engaged with government, at least, uh, the governmental part of the state. I mean, what's been interesting over the last few years in terms of trying to engage government about uh, and history, and I, and I saw this through the Arts and Humanities Alliance, was actually the civil service was being stripped out of a lot of the old boys have disappeared and we've got quite young, much younger civil servants. And some of our negotiators thought that they weren't really up for the job. And, and that actually it's part of the story of Brexit is what happened to the senior civil service and over that period and how many resignations there were and how unprepared the UK ended up being. One of the most effective interventions I thought that uh, was made around the Gove reform was actually David Canadine inviting Kenneth Baker to talk to school teachers, our history school teachers. I don't know if anyone else was at that event, but it was very instructive because what Baker said was, it doesn't matter what Gove comes up with, school teachers will resist and do, do in the end of the day, are capable of doing their own thing. And Baker said, that, you know, he sadly was drawing on his own experience when he came to that conclusion. And I think that's one of the reasons why Justin became interested in the historical association as well, because he saw the potential among school teachers in particular to uh, influence uh, uh, or, 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 in Justin's words, corrupt young minds as his standing joke. Um, but what, of course, he meant was to engage, get younger people to engage in those sort of debates. But I think it's, it's I think, I think we have been in the room, Anna, but the problem is the room is no longer listening. What the room has decided, for example, is to suggest to heads of faculty, and this is from the government policy paper on higher education, free speech and academic freedom, 16th of February, 2021, that's this year, a head of faculty should not force or pressure academics to teach from their own ideological viewpoint or to only use set texts that comply with their viewpoint. This applies equally to contested political ideologies that are not associated with a particular political party or view such as decolonizing the curriculum. Now, that's a fairly serious statement for a, for a government to make. Um, so I think we've got to take seriously that the, the room might be more hostile to us than even when Gove was trying to push through that first set of reforms. Thanks, Graham. Stephen, did you want to add anything at this point on engagement with the state and all its complexities? and multifacetedness. Well, where do you begin? Um, <laughs> yeah, geez. Uh, there's much going on here. Uh, I suppose, um, I suppose in the, in the, in the chat, there was, um, there was a, a point raised about echo chambers. Um, and that kind of made me like think um, that actually, is this very discussion just an echo chamber? You know, if we're talking about debate and changing opinion, um, are we speaking to people necessarily tonight that are the, the people that 
we kind of would want to. Um, like, it, I suppose it's very, I suppose it's very easy to to engage in in a conversation that is um, that kind of you know acts as counselling. Um, but you know, as Justin would say, you know, we need to go on go out there. Um, and I suppose this comes back to the you know the question that probably is on everyone's mind: How do you go out there? What's the best way? Um, and I'm going to confess, I do not have any answers to these questions. Um, but we can, we could, we could probably self-soothe um, until the cows come home. Um, but actually, uh, it's about action, isn't it? Um, deciding on what is appropriate action, what form that action should take, um, and the different types of action. Um, so yeah, that's probably what I'll say. Sorry to sorry to be a bit gloomy. Not at all, Stephen. In fact, I'm I'm going to sort of offer one more prompt to the panel before I open it up to the wider floor, which actually to pick up on your point and also of Miller's about um, the kind of you know formats and uh, or genres or contexts in which we might take a more activist role. And I don't know if uh, picking up on Graham's point about the effects of COVID, whether that affects the kinds of choices we might make about formats and contexts and genres. So if anyone has any reflections on how we might respond to Stephen's challenge and in what formats we might do so, um, please do share. I'd like to return to the possibility of graphic histories. I, I think it's one of the most dynamic genre. And I think it's a way of communicating history, not only through words. I mean, obviously people like Anna who are very skilled in, in using um, visual media, um, we, you know, can, can help us. And, and being able to move between different media with perhaps the same as it were product might be one way of thinking about it so that you can have, you know, a blog, a tweet, an Instagram, a graphic, representation and, and, and so on. It, Ed, Edward was really kind, kind to suggest that I authored the piece on food banks, I actually co-authored, but the two people, I'd love to really point out that there are two of my colleagues here tonight who do the heavy lifting on that project. And like many people around the unit that we've created at Newcastle around oral history, a lot of the work is collaborative. A lot of the work is to recognise that actually in the communities that we work with, there are people who are skilled historians. So setting up those sort of collaborations, I think, are, are really valuable. The team who, Sylvia and um, Alison, who are here tonight, who did the work on food banks, went on to do work around mutual aid and how mutual aid organisations had emerged. And what's interesting there is how many people engaged in that project and how big that project became and it was actually easier because of what was being done online um, and there were fewer travel expenses for me to agree which was fantastic um, so I think there, is, there are real possibilities of making those links now I think events like tonight for example I'm not going to share Stephen's misery not not quite Stephen not quite yet um, are, are actually not just echo chamber I don't think there are actually necessarily echo chambers but there are actually ways that we can discuss how we move forward and how we engage with the publics that we, I, I agree with, with Anna, that we, we, are, we, we, are, we are duty bound to serve. Shamima, I think you tried to come in a couple of times. So do you want to go next? And then I'll ask Anna to, to come back in because I know you need to go, don't you, Anna? So Shamima first. So my comment was just, I think that your access to public spaces as a historian is in many ways shaped by, by the content of the history that you want to tell. Um, so making a, a fairly, um, you know, generalised comment about the Stuarts in, in the past will, will probably not get you too much flack on, on Twitter and various other social media. Saying something um, about the importance of race, migration and empire might uh, create a whole onslaught of um, abuse. The, one of the few events that I did uh, for the public and not for uh, an academic audience on um, the debate on empire 
held by the British Foreign Policy Institute in London. Um, and it was absolutely hideous. I just, me, myself, and the three of the panelists that were a pro teaching histories of, of Britain, uh, of race, migration, and empire in Britain, were just heckled the whole, for the entire kind of hour by uh, three men in particular. And, and the chair was completely, um, essentially quite powerless to, to do anything about it. And I got some sanguine advice from my mentor at the time, um, uh, Margot Finn, the pre former president of the RHS, who just said, you just need to pick your pick your battles, pick what spaces that you choose to, to fight in. And um, from that experience, I, I now don't say yes to any media uh, requests that ask me to debate on, on the value of teaching race, migration and empire. On the other hand, I'm entirely aware that my saying no to those uh, requests means that, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's room for, a Piers Morgan type to, to invent their version of history. But I think arguably that the spaces that you uh, exist in depend on kind of how, you know, the political mood at the time and, and often you're, you're thrown to the wolves. And I don't know what, what the kind of, uh, the solution is to that apart from, you know, allyship is an, an important one where, whereby other kind of historians can, uh, can support you in, in these uh, social media spaces. But it is a, it's, it's a difficult territory when it comes to challenging um, what the public think about history, particularly when they don't want to be challenged. Thanks, Shamima. And I think it's in, thank you for sharing with us that there are personal risks that come with with being, with taking a platform on certain kinds of histories and particularly as a woman and as a person of color, um, those are realities that many historians don't face. And we talk glibly about talking to the public. Uh, we don't often appreciate or are good allies for those who are doing so at, with personal risk. So I think that's an important thing to remember. Um, Anna, I know you need to go. Do you, do you still want to come in? Yeah, I was just going to very quickly say, I think we also need to start sort of potentially being kind of messy in our dissemination. I mean, there's a tendency to think, OK, the out, outlets for public history, you know, a radio or television and may, or maybe doing an op-ed in a newspaper. But, you know, I've just been listening recently to sort of some, you know, chat shows like, you know, LBC or whatever, or some sort of phone in shows. And actually, it's kind of amazing, you know, you get a range of different views and discussions and actually people that, you know, they, people want to be informed, people want, people are interested and it's actually a different kind of audience that might listen to Radio 4 and I think, you know, perhaps there's a responsibility for us to kind of get in in these kind of slightly less typically refined spaces like Radio 4 and actually like take on discussions with people in, you know, in on the sort of shock jocks almost, to use that American phrase, on chat shows and doing that kind of thing as well. Um, I also think that, you know, I'm aware that Twitter is not necessarily, you know, is the, not the only social space. There is, you know, things like TikTok. We need to, I mean, someone's put that in the chat. Those kind of um, social media outlets are really important. Um, and I also think, I mean, I was, again, sort of going back to the whole Brexit referendum, and I think it's just true more generally. I also think that part of our, our training of the next generation of public historians needs to be really helping younger people feel able to and confident to to speak up and speak out because so often the media talks about the 20 somethings how often do you actually hear a 20 something in the media talking um about you know from a historical perspective or or whatever and there just seems to be this gap um and i feel like we need to think in our public history provision about trying to support um younger people to feel like they can speak out and they do have a voice i mean you just you know question time panels when do you see a younger person you see um what's his name the guy guardian columnist who looks like a really young guy but he's actually not can't remember his name now um but uh but you know what i mean so i think so that's also i think part of the responsibility and i suppose thinking back to justin i really feel like he was such a, a supporter and a coacher and a mentor of younger people and I think we also need to kind of take on that that responsibility too in supporting and coaching uh, people to speak out in the public sphere um, from a younger age. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. I'm going to turn. Sorry, Stephen, did you have your hand up there or you just. Yes. Do you want to go ahead and then I'll open up to the floor? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Sorry to, to, to cut you off. Uh, no, just just in response to, to Anna's point, actually, and also following up from something Graham said we've said public history countless times but actually i think it's relevant to say public we there's there's a multitude of publics um if you were working in a different profession marketing for instance 
you'd be pinpointing which segment of the audience you're looking to engage with. We spent a lot of this conversation talking about the public at large. Like, um, that's a, you know, we might be aware of it, but we're still saying it. Is that naivety on our part? Is that, you know, also a bit of the problem? Um, you know, actually meeting people or targeting, not targeting, but going to the places where we will uh, engage people that might not necessarily engage with us has got to be a fundamental part of what we do. Thanks, Stephen. Um, I'm going to turn now to um, the questions in the chat, and I wonder if a good one to open as it's addressed for everyone, which is someone asked about um, if you had an example of what you consider to be outstanding public history and why you thought it was so, because actually that might open us up to the whole range of different genres and formats that we've spoken of earlier. So would anyone like to start with an example that they've seen or heard or witnessed of outstanding public history and why? I guess I can share. I think that one of the most engaging things that I ever um, witnessed, and I think that they do this work consistently, is the Black Culture Archives in Brixton. I think that they really, um, the way that they engage with the public, with not only within their events, but the work that they do and the outreach that they do to the local communities um, that are there coming to the archives is, is really fundamental. Um, and I think that that's kind of the work that I think more public historians should move into again something that's really collaborative that's not only calling necessarily historians to again present or discuss the truth but also to have communities be able to come together and share the impact share their stories i think oral history plays a really important role in this um you know i when i think about the most engaging history um history that i ever learned was really just through talking to individuals and talking to communities i remember whenever i was younger i got to speak to martin luther king's um, neighbor who got to tell me about her lived experiences and watching um, his front porch be bombed. Um, that was again, community-based. That wasn't a historian telling me about it. That was a, someone who was sharing their lived experiences. And so I think to Stephen's point, again, rethinking what do we mean by public and publics um, and not only of us being part of, we have to get them to listen, but also about how do we listen to them, work collaboratively with, collaboratively with them. I think the same thing can be said for education, um, working with teachers rather than talking at them, um, talking about their experiences and vice versa. So I think it's also not only about, again, and I think this is what, again, I got from Justin's work, um, what are historians for? Um, I think part of the reason why you part, not, Totally, but part of the reason why people do see history as just being ornamental, um, no longer functional or useful for students and the public at large is largely because it's largely been presenter based. Um, it's largely been, I'm gonna hear someone talk to me about it on the television, I'm going to be a passive participant um, and rather than something that's active, that's calling people to work and not only that, but see the present of it as well. Obviously, Black Culture Archives does a lot of work with the Windrush, um, Windrush generation um, and actually working with communities who um, were not only a part of that movement, but also victims of the what came from that. Um, so I think, again, those are models or frameworks from which we can work on that really not only work, not only foster collaboration, but also um, um, also foster reflection um, on part of the community as well. And again, just rethinking what we mean when we say that. Fantastic. And thank you so much for mentioning archives, because actually it hasn't come up as a potential space, not only for collaboration, but as a space in which people can make their own histories within their own controls and with the, you know, so that's a really important setting that hasn't come up so far. So thank you for, for mentioning that. Can, can I can I plug the Young Historians Project because I think they're just doing some fantastic work. Um, so most recently they did African migration to Britain to the NHS around the NHS, and I thought that was a fantastic project. And that wasn't you know they started off as an oral history project, but ended up as an archive documentary based project, and it's a it's it's actually brilliant. So I'm gonna I'm gonna post that in chat as a plug. Yeah, absolutely. And, and archives are a wonderful space to give people tools to think with. Um, we were talking before about resources, that, um, that they are active spaces of agency. And we don't often talk about them in that way or don't talk about them enough in that way. Um, does anyone else in the panel want to come in on an ex outstanding example of public history? 
I mean, surely here we should pay tribute to the Old Bailey online. Because, I mean, they were doing this, you know, way ahead of a lot of other projects. And with a real um, model of empowerment. And, you know, you meet people. It happened to me on, on Sunday. I was having a drink with someone and they said, you know what? They're not a historian. They do something quite different. Data analytics. You know, I discovered the old Bailey online and it means so much to me. And here are things I've done with it. And I, for me, that's really a paradigm of, of what can be achieved. And it has the archival dimension, although obviously they're printed sources that were um, digitized, but um, legal history strikes me as a very powerful tool for reaching wide audiences and engaging people. And the person I was having a drink with told me that she found an ancestor of hers who was prosecuted for theft in the 19th century. And I think that way that it can touch people is absolutely fantastic. Shamima, I think you're, are you about to come in with an yeah. example? Yeah, so this is a, uh, again, like um, Graham, a personal flag, I think. Um, but so Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery, it, a couple of years ago, 2018, I think, um, they had an exhibition called Birmingham and the British Empire. Um, and it was a great exhibition for, for many reasons. But the reason that it was a particularly good example of public history is because they invited members of the community, so not curators, to co-curate um, on the exhibition. So there were six um, there were six individuals uh, whom they hired for uh, on temporary contracts for about a year, um, ranged from a teacher in the local community, uh, a historian, um, an activist, a poet, I think, um, and, and they worked with the curator of uh, Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery, and they also hired a, a research assistant. And a part of the, the exhibition itself was about reinterpreting Birmingham's, uh, the BMAG's existing collections to tell this, uh, to tell this history of the city's role with, with empire. And it, it hosted a kind of a whole uh, plethora of kind of uh, collection items and objects uh, related to the gun trade, um, slavery, uh, Joseph Chamberlain, one of the founding fathers of Birmingham, in a in a completely new light, and and so it was telling an old history of the founding, you know, the city of Birmingham, but through this kind of global connectivity with empire, it did incredibly well. Um, it was a temporary exhibition, and there are now plans to make it uh, a permanent one. Um, and I think it was particularly effective because they hired members of the community. And so they made sure that those stories were told. And within the exhibition itself, they also had a huge whiteboard um, whereby visitors could could kind of, and I think this is quite popular now in, in museums or pre-COVID, where you know people could uh, respond to the exhibition itself and how they felt. And there's plans for in the permanent exhibition to include those narratives uh, within it as well. So uh, just yet yeah, to flag Birmingham and the British Empire as a, a really outstanding piece of public history. conventional now uh, which is that there's a lot of quite detailed questions in the chat so I'm going to ask Stephen to think about his outstanding example but while he does that perhaps if the other panelists could have a flick through and pick one question that they might like to answer because I think if we don't do that we're not going to be able to uh, respond to these so um, I'll give the panel the other panelists time to think meanwhile Stephen do you want to share um, an example of outstanding public history with us yeah, um, I think I'd like to uh, just just profile um, about some of the amazing public history work that happens by public artists, obviously something that Justin was increasingly fascinated with. Um, uh, and from my own perspective, because it features quite heavily in my PhD, Hugh Locke's The Jurors at Runnymede, um, uh, you know, a piece of artwork um, installed in 2015 to celebrate 800 years of of Magna Carta's history, legacy, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, why is it interesting? It, it's interesting because it takes and it presents a very multifaceted uh, perspective of Magna Carta's legacy. Um, it's, it allows the viewer, the, you know, the person engaging with it to, to draw their own conclusions. It's, it, it offers a space to reflect um, and I think, you know, increasingly 
public art um, and artists, um, whether they be traditional statues, um, more poet poetry, or you know even plays uh, such as Hamilton, etc. Creative responses to history um, can, in themselves, prove uh, fascinating examples of public history and open up conversations that potentially um, we don't necessarily do um, all the time. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, I'm now going to turn to each of the panelists in turn and ask them to answer a chosen question uh, from the many rich and detailed questions in the chat at the moment. Um, Dosha, would you mind kicking us off? Is there any question that spoke to you at all in the chat? But feel free to pass if you haven't had a chance to look yet. Um, I'm kind of, I think what stood out to me was earlier on in the um, chat when someone asked about the role of museums um, and how, um, what role they play in this conversation. Um, and I definitely think that there's been some really innovative work. Um, I'm thinking here, obviously, in the States of um, really effective, um, but engaging, immersive um, projects that have been put forth. I'm thinking to the African American, um, the National African American and Culture Museum um, that's here in DC. Um, where people are not only there, um, they do have a family gene um, genealogy section where people are able to kind of learn about their own family gene genealogy, but also being confronted with uh, larger issues at hand. So for example, there's a section there in which they've been talking about reparations and how um, the conversation about reparations is important. Um, even at the National Portrait Gallery, which again, are, again, when people think about them, these are national institutions that are having these conversations. Um, there's um, the work of ta Coates, um, who's actually a New Haven-based artist um, who put out a series of paintings kind of really rethinking the founding fathers um, in which Thomas Jefferson is um, being kind of almost, almost draped over a, a picture of Sally Hemings. Um, George Washington is um, kind of adorned with the names of the people in which he enslaved during his lifetime. Um, again, really effective um, pieces of work that are not only about sharing history, but also allowing people to reflect on history is what I would definitely um, offer for museums to really think about whenever they're thinking about crafting um, public history programs, um, as well as as much that we can do to get the public to not only be, again, keep drawing on this, but be active participants in the history, um, I think is important. Thank you so much. Uh, Ludmilla, could I ask you to go next? Is there any question that stood out for you that you might like to respond to? You're on mute at the moment. Sorry. Um, there was a comment about genealogy, which I, um, I wanted to respond to, um, because there's been quite a lot of talk about empathy. And I do think empathy is a bit of a mixed blessing. Um, in that, um, you know how you're told if you're, for instance, someone's relating something that's painful to them that you the one thing you mustn't say is I know how you feel because actually that's not very helpful and insofar as empathy might be interpreted as I know how you feel um, I think we need to be a little skeptical about this so I want to recast this as respect because I actually think there's a form of respect that historians give people by paying attention to them in the most serious and engaged way we know how. So for me, that's the thing I absolutely want to focus on. And of course, family history and genealogy does that too. And by extension then, I think we should extend that respect and seriousness to people who undertake that kind of history. So there are many forms of history research that are done by, quote, amateurs. And the other area I'm quite interested in is military history. Because often when you say the term military history, people go, oh, no, that's awful. That's so boring. That's ghastly. But of course, there are many ways of doing uh, military history. Uh, you can do military history from below. And a book, I don't know how familiar people are with it, um, Michael Roper's book about um, men writing to their mothers during the First World War, I think is a, is a wonderful example of that. Now, it's quite a demanding book, I think, 
Um, but I think it's very powerful. I think it's very deep. So I suppose I wanted to use that comment to kind of um, broaden out the terms in which we might want to think about these things and to have notions like respect and attention. And one of the possibilities, I think, for respect and attention is that they can be reparative. And someone in the discussion raised this before. And I have to say, I absolutely do think that by paying serious attention to bits of the past that have not received their due, historians can have a public reparative uh, effect. And we might be able to have that effect even more powerfully if we make common cause with other kinds of historians who perhaps wouldn't immediately spring to mind, but who nonetheless have a great deal to contribute. Thank you so much. Um, Shamima, is there a question you'd like to speak to? Yeah, there was, a, there was one on um, the role of, of protests and historians um, kind of um, mediation or navigation of that space. I think that uh, given kind of the government uh, Kind of attack on protest at the moment was the context of the question. I think that historians should should participate in in protests as active members of the community, as kind of as part of their civic duty, as opposed to as historians. I don't think that there needs to be a a special status bequeathed to to historians, whereby um, you know, we attend uh, protests or even the the notion that we can defend the idea of protest. I think is a particularly uh, difficult one because it it essentially perhaps implicitly places again a barrier between um history in the academy and and, and the public and you know protest and, and um, engagement in politics is to do with one's own kind of personal beliefs and, and politics so i think that there doesn't necessarily need to be a a, a revered space for for the historian in kind of um, accessing those those spaces um, and and their kind of involvement should be on on their own kind of the personal sense of of, of right and wrong. Um, I think otherwise the danger is uh, this this creation of of separation and and a, and a hierarchy. Um, uh, again, in in Justin's kind of um, much of his his activism it felt like he was kind of emotionally invested in, in all, all of the causes that he championed. Um, and that, that has to be at the heart of protests at all times, I think. Thank you so much. Graham, finally, it, would you like to pick a question? Yeah, to I've got answer? a couple here directed at me, but I, I thought, I, I think the relationship between the historians and the state um, and various parts of the state, I think take Louis's point about that, is an interesting one and you know we've got John Tosh in the room and I think history and policy has been a good good initiative I think that's 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 made a difference about I think Alex your work as well points us in the direction of thinking about how we might influence policy so some of that work is being done um, on a on a sort of work level you know again going back to the work that we've been doing with food banks uh, we've managed to uh, influence at least two reports there but we've also I think more importantly for me at least I think that we've connected up past food poverty with present day food poverty and we began to explain how sections of the population generationally have, effect, have been affected by food poverty and I think that's getting some echo among some quarters. Um, the problem then becomes about how even once we've influenced that policy what then happens and you know I, I think probably my money's probably on a footballer rather than a historian to make change in that area. Um, so again, like Jimmy, you know, I think we need to put ourselves in our place sometimes and think, well, what is possible and what can we actually do? And it's not really for us to carry the weight of the world on our shoulders alone. And again, going back to that point about trying to engage collaboratively with communities that need uh, our help or, or not even, they don't even need our help, but we can help to defend. Thank you so much. I think that's a fantastic note on which to end. I hope we've done justice, I hope the audience feels we've done justice to the, the range of questions that have come in. Um, I'd like to say my personal thanks to all our speakers and to the many, many people who have joined the audience. I hope it has been a fitting tribute to engagement with response to and taking forward of Justin's ideas. But I know that uh, Edward and John would also like just to, to say some thank yous and to wrap up 
uh, to tonight's proceedings. Um, so thank you, everyone, and good night. Thank you, Alex, and, and, and warmest thanks to all of our speakers. I, I really enjoyed listening to you all. Um, it, it was kind of emotional at times because just looking at your faces reminds me of Justin and reminds me of a different time when we, we, we could very easily be together in the same room. Um, and sincere thanks to everyone who's taken the time to tune in this evening. Um, it just it gives me great hope. I mean, Stephen's warning about echo chambers notwithstanding, um, you know, this is a public forum and anyone can tune in. And I'm sure there is lots of, there's all kinds of opinions and points of view and generations and types of people represented in this space this evening. I just want to say a, a couple of quick things about Justin. It, it's been a really fitting discussion. I think it's a great tribute to uh, uh, a much loved historian, but also a much loved man. Justin left us in June of last year, and the roughly 14 months since then have been in some ways a brutal time to be a public historian, a really terrible time to work in a public history institution or to be attempting to communicate with the public about the past. You know, it's been devastating for people who work in museums uh, or heritage sites or who work in, in, in the public history sector, what we've lately come to call the public history sector. Also, as several of our panelists, notably Daisha and Shamima, reminded us, the government um, and other kind of elements of the power structure have uh, launched some pretty brazen attacks on historians and, uh, and made some fairly bold attempts to shape the public narrative of the past. So in some ways, it's been a terrible year to be a public historian. In other ways, however, it's been absolutely fascinating. It's been a fascinating time to be involved in shaping narratives of the past or be involved in discussions of the past in the public space, whether it's here in the United Kingdom or elsewhere around the world. Um, the, you know, the, the dumping of Edward Colston into the harbour in Bristol, I could, you would be hard pushed to pinpoint a more public history moment, a, a, a mo moment in which the public more passionately engaged with the past in this country, uh, in Britain, than, than that. that and, and coincidentally, ironically, if you like, it happened at around the same time that, that Justin left us. Um, so Justin's call for a more consciously activist approach to the past has clearly never been, at least I feel, never been more relevant. And I'm pretty optimistic about it, I have to say, because the public seem to be demanding more confrontational, more complicated, more, um, yeah, more honest discussions about our relationship with things like empire, decolonization, slavery, and so forth. So, you know, the, I, I've, I've lots of hope and optimism as we go forward. Just on a more personal note, this really struck me when Anna, Anna mentioned this in, in her own comments that, you know, she said, think of Justin the man. Justin was a great historian. Um, and as John really highlighted in his opening comments, he, he was a great academic historian before he was ever known as a public historian. You know, he was a, a real scholarly commentator on early modern Britain, the early modern history of ideas and so forth. Um, and he was a, a great advocate for public history, and he was a scholar, and he was a great administrator within the academy, teacher, etc. But he was also just a real gent. He was a great guy to know. He was a great guy to work with. He was a real influence on me, not just as a, as a historian, but a, as a man, I think, as well, you know. And as Anna suggested, he, he was, uh, everything with Justin was tone. You know, he was um, highly opinionated extremely well informed. Uh, he would speak at the drop of a hat, but he wasn't remotely self-righteous. There was nothing of, of the sanctimonious about Justin Champion. And that to me is, is as profound and as meaningful a legacy as any of the, you know, any of the articles he published or any of the advocacy he did as, you know, president of the, of the Historical Association. So on that note, I just want to thank you all warmly for attending. I think it's been a, a, a wonderful tribute to a, a truly great man. Yes, it's been a fantastic tribute. It's been a tribute to a man that I myself didn't know well. I had uh, sort of encounters with him on a few, on a few and a far basis, so that's why I mentioned being an external examiner. So I can simply endorse what Edward has said from what I from what from the way I equa became acquainted with Justin from his works and his and his very uh, focused public history works, which were a, a delight and a stimulus. And I just wanted to end with one substantive point that we, we, that we have to think where our critical mass 
of historically savvy people is. And one thing we've neglected in the discussion this evening is undergraduates, undergraduates who acquire degrees in history and who in most institutions of higher learning receive very little or no orientation about how their hard-won historical knowledge might have practical application, might have a role to play in the policy field. Um, it's very rare to find an, an undergraduate degree where the course ends with some kind of attempt to pull together the history that's been covered and consider what applications it might have. It did happen at my institution for about three years before I retired, and I would like to see it elsewhere. So I just make that, that one personal plug um, as my way of rounding off a evening which has been enormously stimulating and, as people have said, very enjoyable. Thank you very much.